how did you get involved with um, musical theater growing up? When did you know you wanted to do it professionally? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, you know, growing up, I was always involved in the arts. Um, and um, not by default, but like I started taking ballet at a super early age because I was severely pigeon toed when I was younger. So, um, you know, I had a physical therapist that said like to put me in ballet. Um, so, you know, I, I was in ballet, I, in dance classes, I was, I played, um, violin and piano, and then I was in like children's theater groups and stuff like that. And, um, I always loved it. I always, you know, had a, a great time. Um, but it wasn't really until, I was in high school that I was introduced to the idea of doing theater as, as a career. Um, and partially because I, I grew up in Southern California where there's, there, there's theater around, but not like New York, you know? Um, and also when I was growing up, there wasn't as many opportunities for young people to be a professional, um, you know? And now it seems like, there's so many, so many more opportunities for, for young people that like want to start working or what have you. Um, but I was, I was in high school when I really fell in love with musical theater and when I really um, set my sights on New York and wanting to, to be on Broadway. Awesome. And so you were a part of the original company of Wicked um, as the standby. Yes. Uh, what was the audition process like and like how did you get casted for that show? Uh, yes. Okay. So um, I had heard of this, this show um, called Wicked, you know, long before it had come to Broadway um, because I was friends with Stephanie J. Block, who we both grew up in Orange County. And she had done all the original workshops and readings that they had done in LA here. Um, and so I'd heard about it a, a little bit. Um, and I was actually, uh, I, my first audition for Wicked was for, for the role of Nessa Rose. And um, I didn't get that. And I was actually originating and developing another show um, called Brooklyn that we were, and our out of town tryout at the same time that Wicked was doing their out of town tryout in San Francisco. And I remember um, talking to Stephanie and she got the news that she was cast in this musical uh, with Hugh Jackman called The Boy From Oz. And so she said, you know, cause um, she ended up being in the ensemble and a cover for Alphaba when they were out of town um, because they had had Idina Menzel doing the role now. Um, and she said, you know, they're going to be looking for, you know, an understudy or a standby. You should tell your agents that you want to go in. And so I told them about it and they brought me in and I had an initial audition, um, which was just me singing my own song. And then they brought me back with uh, material to learn, um, which was Defying Gravity, a portion of Defying Gravity. And uh, uh, one, I think one scene, the Fallen House scene, which is the, the fight scene between Elphaba and Glinda. And, you know, it was very hush-hush at the time. You know, you didn't have, YouTube wasn't a thing that back then so you didn't have like reference tracks or accompaniment tracks or anything like that and um, there was no there was no sheet music um because they were very private about it so i um stephanie came over and coached me on my audition she sang defying gravity into um my tape recorder this I'm really dating myself right now <laughs> into a tape recorder so I could learn it and then she coached me on the scene and gave me context um, because they wouldn't give you the script either so um my callback were, was that material they asked me to wear a black dress and um and that was it 
Um, it was not the audition process that happens now. Um, now it's very rigorous. You know, they make you do all, almost all the songs off of the things and they make you do it like over and over again and they bring you in and they keep bringing you in and they keep bringing you in. Um, so I think that, I think that the women now that go in for it um, have to go through a lot more than, than I did back in the day. But um, yeah, that, that was my audition process. And um, while you were a standby for Idina, did you learn anything from her that kind of helped you almost create your alphabet when you went to replace the character and go on to play it in other productions of the show? Yeah, I mean, you know, having been the second person to play it on Broadway, I only had her to, to learn from, you know, and um, <clears throat> when I joined the company, they were still in tech. Um, you know, Adina had, had torn her meniscus and her knee and they weren't sure at the time if, if she was gonna need surgery. So they brought me in way earlier than, than um, the other standby for, um, for Glinda. And so I was there just hanging around while, while they were teching the show in the Gershwin and they, just told me absorb as much as you can. Here's your script. We'll pull you every now and then to learn music, um, just to get me as ready as possible. And so I, you know, my my first introduction to Elphaba was was Adina and 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 very um, various in various stages. You know, in in rehearsals, off to the side, a little private rehearsal on stage in front of an audience. So it was really cool to see, to watch her process and how she um, handled this, this huge role and this huge responsibility. Um, and, you know, I didn't go on for a very long time. So I spent a lot of time, you know, watching the show. And I think that her version is definitely, was definitely an inspiration, um, especially at the beginning, you know, there were just, just little nuances that she she had um, that are so in my mind just so innately alphabet because you know she's the original so um, over time and the, the longer I had relationship with the, the show and the role and the creative team I was able to you know make it my own and put my own stamp on it which was so um, so rewarding and such a gift but um, yeah she definitely she definitely um, influenced and inspired me on, on many occasions. Um, and you went on to do a four productions of Wicked. Would you say your alphabet changed at all um, through each produ production you did? 100%, yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, yeah, it's, it's, all, it's um, two parter of the reasons why. I mean, I am a very, um, and, you know, I didn't go to school for musical theater. So at the time when I was doing Wicked at the very beginning, I was 25 years old. I was very young and <laughs> I don't, no pun intended, but very green. Like I didn't have a lot of experience. And, um, and so when I would leave to do other things and come back, I grew, I had grown um, as an artist and, and as a woman. Um, and so, of course, as I had more life experience, um, you know, my perception and my version of Elphaba grew as well and, and had more depth and more nuance. Um, but also, you know, I'm a very, um, I try to be as present as possible and to really take in my scene partners every time. And so with a completely different cast every time, you're your performance is going to inherently be different um, because you're you're reacting and responding to different people and different perspectives and point of views and different emotions. And so, um, you know, I, I can say I was honestly blessed enough to be in in all the companies that I was in. They were all just like amazing. So, um, yes, over the years, over the seven years I did the role, my my alphabet definitely definitely changed. And um, I know a lot of Elphabas talk about um, their no-fly shows because sometimes it can be quite the experience. Did you have any yes. no-fly shows that that kind of stick out? Yeah, I did. I definitely did. Um, 
it was, uh, I haven't had that many, possibly two. Um, and you know, no one really, I have to be honest in saying like, by the time it happened to me, I had only been the standby on Broadway. And then I went to, I went and did the San Francisco stop of the national tour for six weeks. Um, and so my experience is that, that up until that point that had never happened on Broadway, but it happened on the tour quite often as from what I heard. And so, um, I had never really <laughs> rehearsed what was supposed to happen um, at that at that time, other than I knew how to let myself out of the levitator. Mm -hmm. And I knew to walk down stage. But anything other than that, I I didn't really rehearse. And I know I did one show in LA before we went to San Francisco as my put-in. And <laughs> I had like family and, and friends at the show and I didn't go. I, I wasn't moving forward and then I, I knew I wasn't gonna go. And so I was like looking out of my peripheral vision into the wings and I saw the crew guys telling me, like motioning to behind their back to say like, let yourself out, let yourself out. So I let myself out and I, walked down stage center and then I what I didn't know is that the cast was gonna get on the floor <laughs> and like sing that look at her she's wicked down from the floor with their arms up to make me seem like you know I was flying and I remember my boyfriend at the time he and his he had seen me in the show before but his family was there and they didn't even know you know they I was so disappointed you know and and I'm like, I'm just so sad that like, that, that we had some tech problems and they, they were like, what are you talking about? Like, which part are you talking about? And they didn't know because they didn't, they just didn't know what they were missing. And so they enjoyed it just as much. But um, <laughs> yeah, that's the most memorable no fly. I, it might've happened to me one other time, but that's really the only one that sticks in my mind. Um, and then four, you closed the company of Rent. Um, yes. Eight. I know you, you said that you auditioned for the role actually uh, multiple times before you got casted. Um, what was your reaction when you were finally um, offered the role to close the company? Oh, it was um, uh, a little bit of disbelief. Like I, I could, I've never, well, I had never been offered something uh, without auditioning for it. So that in itself was a big deal for me. Um, but then after so many years of loving the show and, you know, wanting to be Maureen and also my connection, you know, with Adina and having her be the first one and then the opportunity to be the last one on Broadway, um, it was just extremely uh, humbling. It really was. Um, and one of many dreams that have come true for me. Awesome. And so the final show was filmed for the DVD. Did you guys get any sort of uh, practice with the cameras or how did that work? Yes. Um, so we, we had a few, um, we had one day, I believe, uh, maybe two days were of, of pickup shots. Um, we knew that we were going to be filmed, obviously, for the final show. Um, but there were certain shots that they wanted close-ups um, or on-stage shots for that they wouldn't be able to get in the live performance without disrupting the show. So there were certain pickups that... Um, that we got. And so that was really the only time that we rehearsed anything, but the show was the show that we had been re running for, you know, I think all of that final cast, we were all together for like three months. So um, we didn't have to change anything or adapt anything really um, other than those very, you know, I, what I'm talking about is there's a couple times where like, you can tell the cameras on stage with us those moments um the rest of it was was like from from the closing night so there was nothing that we had to like reblock or or um change and was there a specific moment in the show that 
uh, the last show that really felt like, wow, this is it. This is the last time we're going to play these characters. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, the whole thing, I, I feel like that whole day, and that whole week was was insane. But that day before the show, um, you know, we had we had planned on at the end bringing on the original cast and so we had to rehearse that with them and um and it was really that opening <laughs> when we all run on stage and uh mark starts saying his lines i will never forget that feeling because it we were greeted with a tidal wave of sound uh, and energy and i was just crying already at the top of the show because it was just so beautiful because so many, you know, so many cast members from the past and all of our family and friends and fans from New York, you know, fans of the show and Jonathan's family and, you know, every, every Roger, Mark, Maureen, you know, they were just all there. And it was, um, it was a, an electric, beautiful night. But that moment, there were so many moments, but that particular one when we all ran out was like, whoa, I don't know if I've ever, ever felt something so like electric. And Rent has a, it's had such a huge legacy ever since it closed. Uh, it resonates with so many people. Why do you think it has continued to inspire so many people after all these years? Mm. Well, it's funny, it's funny when people um, refer to Rent as a period piece, um, you know, it's, it definitely is now and it's definitely, you know, and not in a negative way, but it's definitely dated. Um, but I think that the, the concepts, um, the words that Jonathan wrote are universal and they're timeless. Um, and and I also believe that these characters are um, are very human um, and very flawed. And the fact that these group of people came together to form a family at that particular time in their lives, I think so many people can relate to that. Um, you know, a group of misfits at the time. You know that that become chosen family and and support each other and fight and, and um, lift each other up and, and mourn and grieve and, and celebrate. There's just, you know, I think that, I think that everyone can relate to that and has people in their lives that are like that. And so I just think that, that, um, you know, those are the things that transcend um, time and, and generations. And so when you were in um, Brooklyn, the musical, that was a character you got to create. Um, what was it like being able to create a character almost from scratch compared to other roles where they had already been played by multiple actors? Yes. Um, you know, the, the analogy that I like to use is, is, you know, if you have a couture gown or a custom made suit that is made literally for every curve and every angle of your body. Um, and that's what originating a role is. It's really being involved in, you know, in keys of songs and the way that you sing it, you know, the way that you, you emote and the way that you, um, execute is documented and you know there are there are if you're lucky you're involved on a in a creative process that you're allowed space to contribute meaning your opinions and um and that's invaluable and that you don't get all the time um you know blocking wise like ah, this feels kind of awkward can we try it this way you know once a show is cemented and and frozen you you can't come in as as a replacement and, and do that um so that kind of stuff is um is treasured and, and rare and um and so I'm, I'm, I'm proud of Brooklyn and I'm proud that to be the original of, of our little, our little show. And, uh, and yeah. Awesome.
And um, one of the most recent roles you played was Trina in the tour of Falsettos. Um, Falsettos is a very, it's a very complex show and Trina's very different from all the other characters, most of the characters that you played. What was it like jumping into that show? Um, it was an, a nightmare, um, <laughs> but in, in, a, in a good way, in the sense that like, you know, this was the shortest amount of time I've spent learning a brand new show. Um, we learned the entire show and teched it in two weeks. Um, you know, we had one day of mu we we had one day of music, um, and then we blocked all of Act One in the first week, and one day of music for Act Two, and blocked all of Act Two, and then the at the very end of the week. Uh, beginning of the next week went to our first city and teched it so it was incredibly fast especially that music is so intricate um and uh that it it, it was a nightmare but we did it and, and then not to mention the cube and the blocking and it was in, you know it was just incredibly hard to not know the words and hold your pages but while we were moving pieces of that cube and and all of that but uh, the creative team was so prepared and so patient and we did that. Like I, we literally talk about that all the time of looking back at that rehearsal period into tech in our first city going, what the heck? I, I can't believe we did that. And yes, I was just now um, editing myself. So I wouldn't say a bad word. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but then, you know, we had an amazing time on the tour. We all got very, very close. And, um, and yeah, Trina, Trina definitely was a different role for me and not necessarily a role that I was drawn to, but um, uh, she fell into, she didn't fall into my lap. I mean, I, I auditioned, but um, I'm glad that our paths crossed because I, um, I had an amazing time playing her. Did you have a favorite moment in the show to perform? Um, it might be feel all right for the rest of your life. Um, you know, all of us do, and while they're racquetballing and, and Mendel and Trina are in their workout clothes and, and the lesbians are doing their, you know, their thing. I, I loved that moment that, because we all had our own things going and then the, the fun at the end. Um, what else did I love? You know, I, I did love the sentimental, sad moments as well. And I really enjoyed um, my moments on, with, my, with my son, my onstage son. You know, I'd never played a mom before. So to have um, these young spirits, like to connect with them as an actor on stage is something that uh, a gift from that time that... Um, that I will treasure forever because it was very, very special. Nice. And you've done a lot of um, really awesome out of town shows like Avita and In the Heights. Do you have a favorite show that you got to do? Ooh, that is hard, Jess. Okay. Well, I've had, oof, that's so hard because they've all been gems, if I'm being honest. I will say that the two that stick out, I can't do it. I can't do it. Avita was a dream come true for me. And to collaborate with my longtime friend, Matt Logan, who was our director and also scenic designer and costume designer, that was a dream, you know, bucket list. But the, the two roles that really uh, stick out Oh my gosh, three because I, oh my gosh, this is too hard. Um, I loved Merrily, we roll along that I did in Boston, working with Maria Friedman and, and that cast was insane. And Mary was also a departure for me um, as far as the type of character. And I really loved creating her. But also I got to originate a role in a Michael John LaCusa show, um, which was, yeah, I mean, sign me up for anything that man does um and then also Lempica at Williamstown you know we were supposed to be at La Jolla Playhouse um last spring but the pandemic happened so um I've been involved with that show for a while and um 
you know, I would like, I would like more audiences to be able to see that show and, and to get to know Tamara. So I'm sorry. I have to, I know they're all oh, my babies. I can't choose one. <laughs> <laughs> And then for um, the stage door, and that has become a very big part about when you see a show, to stage door, meet the cast after. Have you had any um, stage door interactions with fans that stuck out to you that um, are memorable? I love them all. Um, you know, I, um, I'm never going to forget the first time I went to New York and I saw Rent, which was my first Broadway show, and waiting at the stage door and... And um, feeling the difference between people who really genuinely took the time to look me in the eye and hear what I had to say and say what, you know, or the people that were just trying to get home, which I completely understand. Um, but I remember how it made me feel. And I never, I vowed, like, I never, ever want to make anyone feel that way, even if I've had the worst day of my life. So there were times that, when I felt like I couldn't give somebody the energy and the time that they deserved, then I wouldn't do the stage door at all. Um, you know, because I never wanted to make somebody feel like they were inconveniencing me or that I was irritated. Um, but, um, you know, I feel, I really value, and I, I take a long time at stage doors usually, usually because um, if someone has spent money to come see me in a show and then wants to share with me after how my performance made them feel or, or share a story with me or get a picture with me. Um, it's the least I could do. And so I appreciate those moments and I, and I treasure them and I haven't really had any bad experiences. I mean, a couple of times people mean the, the flip side of that is like, I think people have spent, you know, two and a half hours watching you and they feel like they know you. And so the familiarity of like taking your arm and here, come take a picture with my daughter. And you're like, excuse me, why are you pulling me? <laughs> or, or, oh, you sounded a little, you know, just like wanting to be real with you. I was like, you sound a little tired today. Everything okay? Um, and you're like, um, yeah, everything's okay. I'm tired. <laughs> You know, so sometimes it is a little like, did you think about what you were going to say to me before you actually said it? And I don't think anyone ever meant any harm, but you know, we're sensitive people. And so sometimes you're like, oh, great. They, they thought I sounded like crap the entire time, but um, I haven't had any bad or crazy experiences really at the stage door. That's good. Um, yeah. <laughs> so a uh, stepping away a little bit from um, your musical theater, um, your album, Revelation, um, which is really awesome. What was the process? Thank you. You're welcome. What was the process and the journey of creating that album? I had always wanted to write music. And um, when I was younger, I did a lot. And um, I was always just really afraid. I would kind of self-sabotage myself um, and judge my, my, judge the result before I even began it. And so I, um, I heard a friend of mine's album and then, and I asked her like, who produced this? Like, I just love the sound of it and I love the vibe and, um, and it happened to be her then boyfriend at the time now her husband and and I was like I would he produce my next album and this this guy um his name's Blaine Stark he has nothing to do with theater doesn't really know that much about theater didn't know who I was other than his wife's friend um and um you know he was encouraging me to write you know he's like do you write music I said no but I've always wanted to I've just been afraid and He's like, well, I've only been talking to you for 20 minutes and I think you have a lot to say and why don't you try it? Um, so I looked through my journals and, and started writing every day, just like, okay, Eden, don't think of them as songs, just like write what you're feeling, write thoughts, write any little idea you have. And then I 
then I reached out to my friends who have been writing songs much longer than I have and, and asked them to collaborate with me. And that was the process. And some of the songs are literally almost verbatim taken out of my, my um, journals. Um, some of them are, we came up with the idea on the spot. Um, but it was a, it was a beautiful, scary collaborative process. <laughs> And so um, it's very, very intimate. Um, and uh, I, I, it was funny because people would ask me, like, how did you, not how did you be so raw and vulnerable, but like, why did you decide to? I think that's what somebody posed a, a question in an interview. And I was like, I didn't have any other choice because I, I'm so new to songwriting that I, I didn't have enough skill in that art form to go, yes, let's craft it like this. <laughs> it was literally like, bleh, just like <laughs> feeling emotion word vomit all over a page. And then we made it into a song. Um, so, so yeah, it's, um, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely a, a page out of my soul for sure. <laughs> And then um, how, how much time start to finish? Like, when did you start um, creating the album? I actually started, um, geez, Louise, when was that? May of 2017. And then I think I started writing then or, or 18. I, I know I was continuing to write in Boston when I was doing Merrily We Roll Along. And then um, we recorded it. Actually, we recorded a lot of things um, before I went to Boston. And then I re, -re oh, no, no, this is wrong. This is wrong. I got the timeline now. I got it now. Um, writing I started writing when I was in Boston and then we recorded some stuff before I went to Williamstown for Lempica and when I was doing Lempica the that role is so vocally demanding that like my voice got in better shape so then after that I went back home and re-recorded the vocal to almost every song except for one um that was a live pass that we did with the band um which was uh ready um and so that was in 2018 and then it came out in January of 19 so a year and a half I would say all together yeah and um, going back to now um Broadway musical theater um rejection can obviously hurt and not always be great to hear how do you um continue going after you've been told no for role? what kind of motivates you to just keep going yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I feel like when you're, I'm just going to speak from my, from my experience, you know, when I was younger and was new to the industry and new to New York, like I just, it, rejection didn't really bother me because I was just like, you know, wide-eyed and, and just doing so excited to be there and excited to audition. And, um, and then once I, once I had like some, some success, whatever you want to call success, I started working a lot. And then um, it was when I stopped working uh, that things started to really have a mental effect on me, rejection. Um, and it started to have a, a huge um, effect on my self-worth. And, um, and, yeah, I was in a dark place for a long time. So, and I had to take a break and I just was not doing well in the audition room. And I felt like I was just um, like swirling down the toilet. Um, <laughs> and I took a break. I, I felt like I needed, um, I needed a skill set and I needed some tools to help me overcome my nerves and my anxiety when it came to auditioning. And so I took a two-year acting program at the William Esper studio and and it changed my life um and and it changed my perspective because um 
I really, I really believe in, you know, what's meant to be yours is, will, will be yours. And it's not going to pass you by if it's meant to be you. And anything beyond that is, doesn't concern me. Um, I also have learned, you know, having been in the business for so long and having people who, you know, were coming up in the business at the same time I was, and now are successful, uh, agents or casting directors. Um, and ha you know, I, I have had really intimate conversations. I've, I've, I've talked to them about all of this and the truth of the matter is, is they're on your side and they want you to do well. And so, you know, it's not personal if you don't get it and it doesn't mean you're not talented and it doesn't mean you're not good enough. It just means that this one wasn't for you. Um, and so I try to, I try to keep that at the forefront and, and put my energy on all I have control over is preparation and going in that room and showing them who I am and, and what I can bring to this character. And beyond that is none of my business unless they give me the job. <laughs> and then um, lastly, I like ending with some advice that um, for future performers. So if you could give advice to um, people who want to have a career in musical theater beyond Broadway one day, what would it be? Um, my strongest piece of advice that I like to give is, you know, these, the generations that are coming up are so inundated with information and videos and recordings and content, content, content. And it's easy to compare yourself to other people. And it's easy to, um, it's easy to lose yourself in that and trying to be like this person or trying to be like that person. And, you know, when we are all given a specific set of gifts um, that make us stand out from everyone else, just automatically. And so instead of trying to be the next, you know, Sutton Foster or the next Audra McDonald or the next Aaron Tave, it's like be the first you. And yes, you can be inspired by and you can, you know, strive to be like, you know, whoever. But I feel like more and more I see young artists losing their sense of self and and not really knowing who they are and what they have to offer and so I really try to encourage um, young artists that I work with and coach and do master classes for to to get to know yourself and spend some time getting to know you um, so that you know what you have to offer which is singular and um, and nobody can take that away from you Thank you.